one, Mr. Grinch. Hey, what you, you really are a deal. Hey, yes. You're as happy as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. I think we'll freeze You're that banana with a greasy black Hey, guys. We're excited to sit with you today. It's a little bit kind of a different. Ooh, these are comfy. These are comfy at home, okay, but man, this, they're right? even more comfy up here. I like it. Yeah. So no pulpit today, um, because today we're going to talk about sorrow. And sorrow is not a topic that um, I don't know that I feel like you can be preached at for that. It's more of a, 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 a discussion of inclusion. And so um, we're just going to share with you what the Lord has put on our hearts um, about sorrow. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, as we prayed over this and, you know, just being very transparent, you know, sorrow is it's a tough topic to talk about. There's yeah. so much to cover and we're not going to be able to cover it all. Um, I would need initials after my name to be able to do a lot of justice to it. Um, Stephanie has initials after her name, but she needs different ones um, to handle it. So, but can we just share our story with you? And some principles that God's shown us about sorrow. And as we go through it this morning, can we do that? Amen. All right. So, Brussels sprouts. How does everybody feel about them? Come on. Right. Oh, uh, no, who, no. Who's pro, who's pro Brussels sprouts? Come on, guys. Right. Who They're says they're in the nastiest things that God has ever created? <laughs> See, it is generally that case. Right? It is You're a mean one. Mr. You're Grinch, again. you really are a deal. You're as ugly as a cactus, you're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with us. keeps trying Greasy to steal the show deal. every single time. To the like, left, to the right. Okay. <laughs> so when I, when I bring that up, everybody felt pretty immediately a certain kind of way about Brussels sprouts, right? Brussels sprouts in and of themselves are a dense and bitter vegetable. They're nasty. And so I, I would argue that anybody who has had them and does not like them probably has not had them prepared correctly. Because you had some bacon grease, some bacon. <laughs> bacon, bacon just anoints everything, doesn't it? Yeah. Or grapeseed Ma oil. Maybe a little um, bacon. You just, shh. And then maybe some balsamic vinegar. If, has anybody ever had Bobby Jackman's cooking? Okay. That brother has a gift. If you're having a Mexican night and you invite him over, empanadas. Empanadas and thank me later. Can I tell you who else makes amazing Brussels sprouts? Who? He's in the house right now. It's a youth. It's Izzy Burblinger. Izzy, Izzy Bur makes oh, some yeah, amazing does. Brussels sprouts. He, he brought them to our Thanksgiving gathering. They rocked. So, kind of deviated off the topic here. but Sorry, I had to give a shout out to Izzy. Yeah, yeah. So... Brussels sprouts, there's other ingredients that we could use, um, but the point kind of being is that there's ingredients of life that, if aren't properly handled and prepared, can, can have negative out aspects. Anger can be destructive, right? It can turn into wrath. Fear can become paralysis. And confidence can become arrogance. Any, any one of our ingredients of life, right, much like sorrow, can, if not handled properly, can be destructive. However, in God's hands, anger can become justice, can, can drive us to justice. Fear can be transformed and redeemed into boldness. And confidence can empower us to have faith. So today, we're going to talk about the sorrow that stole Christmas. In true live stream fashion in the last three weeks, we're going to go ahead and show you a clip of the good old Grinch experiencing just a little taste of sorrow. <laughs> okay, I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> family tells me I don't have any compassion whatsoever, so that might be a, a little glimpse of it, at least not compassion for them. I have compassion for all of you, but I have no compassion for them whatsoever. So, um, 
<laughs> one of the, I was looking up, um, just Googled, why was the Grinch sad? And one commentator said, well, he was overweight and he needed dental work. So that's why he was sad. I was like, all right, that sounds legit. Um, but the whole, perp the whole message behind the, um, the Grinch is that he had a heart that was two sizes too small. And that's um, ultimately when he started to feel and he started to experience emotions um, and his heart started to grow, you know, that, that's when things changed in his life. You know, during Christmas time, all jokes aside, sorrow is compounded. Like, it just, it grows. When that special person isn't in the room that's supposed to be in the room, when that place setting that that place that person sits at is no longer filled, when their laugh isn't heard over the group, and in our case, when that classic joke is said and they're not there to deliver it, that's when that sorrow hits. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not usually a crier, but there's a chance that you're going to see some tears up here today. Because in the process of, of, of um, exploring what God has for us in sorrow, I've been able to cry a little bit more. And I've been blessed by those tears. Yeah, and I, I'm not a crier. You will not see me cry this morning. But, you know, talking through sorrow, and even this morning, you're probably already feeling some of the, some kind of way, some kind of feeling coming up, you know, memories coming up right now of your own experiences of sorrow, and they can be bitter. Maybe a lost job, or even the outcomes of our past choices. Who can be with me on that one, right? If I hadn't been such a knucklehead and done blah, X, Y, Z, Man. And even more so, we all know believers that have passed on, but we also know people that have passed on that we aren't sure that knew Jesus. And that's a whole different level of grief, isn't it? So today our big idea is this, just like Amy. Sorrow will impact every facet of our lives, but God's comfort will redeem it and make it beneficial. Think but about that. Let's mow that roll one more time. Sorrow will impact every facet of our lives, but God's comfort will redeem it and make it beneficial. So, so let's open our Bibles, if you have them, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. And the verse says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Here, Paul's opening his second letter to the Corinthians, and he's speaking of the God of all comfort, which is it's an, an, an interesting lead-in. The word that he's used here is paraklesis. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's a Greek word that means more than just simple sympathy, like, oh, right? It speaks of standing beside a person, giving solace or comfort, encouraging and helping in a time of trouble. There, there's action involved with it. Paraclesis comes from the same root where we get the word paraclete, which is the, Paul, the word Paul uses when he talks about the Holy Spirit, when he uses the comforter. And the Holy Spirit is active in and through Christ and us in those times of comfort. So in the spring of 2021 and um, into the spring of 2022, it was a difficult year for us. And actually, it was a difficult year for a lot of people in our church. Um, for our specific family, uh, family we had experienced um, um, damaged family ties. Um, we had experienced, there was a tragic loss of one of our Union High School students that ended up being intricately um, a part of our youth's lives. Um, the loss of Brent's dad um, just three days after Chris, or before Christmas. Um, then Brent went on to have um, a situation at work that didn't go the way that um, he hoped it would, um, a conversion. And then my uncle passed away um, in just a couple, a full month after Brent's dad passed away. Um, but in between that time of my, my father-in-law passing and my uncle passing, I lost um, a person who quickly became um, a friend to me that I was 
um, on the journey with as they were um, journeying to be closer to God. He had a chronic illness, and he was ready to see the Lord. And um, I had the opportunity to walk along that family, and they blessed us sincerely during that, that time. You know, there's so many things that make sorrow difficult. Um, the moment of the loss, whether it's a relationship or whether it's loss of dreams, um, loss of family, whether it's loss of life, your world feels like it's stopped. Has ever, anybody been in that situation? You get the phone call. You get the text. You get and, 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 and as soon as those words come out, your world just stops. The first time I felt this was Easter Sunday, 1998. The first time. I was 18 years old. I had experienced lots of people um, passing in our life before, but that was the first time that I was like, <gasps> and I remember thinking, why is the world still spinning? Why hasn't everyone stopped like my world has stopped? I remember the text when the Union High School student died. I remember the moment that our son walked out of the house, and I didn't know if that was going to be the last time that I saw him. I remember after John took his last breath, before you leave the room, I remember talking to Jerry about Bud. I remember the phone call between me and my mom when my uncle had passed away from his, the, a tragic farming accident. Hanging up that phone, moving on from those texts. You take a couple moments to think about the next step. You've got this information, and then you take a breath, you think about the next steps, and then you enter into the world to take those next steps, and the world is still moving. But my grief is still going on. Sometimes our grief comes in gentle waves. I'm sure you've all experienced. You have a memory that comes in. Sometimes it makes you smile. Sometimes it's a tear that fills your eye. But then sometimes grief, grief comes in in a tsunami. Has anybody experienced the tsunami? And it's not so much the heavy wave that it hits, but it's how far you're dragged out when that wave overcomes you. And that was the fear that I experienced as a parent going into sorrow. Jesus was fully God and fully man. So he experienced grief just like we did. The most common example that we think of is Lazarus. And that famous shortest verse in the Bible, right? Jesus wept. He famously weeps and then goes into the tomb to raise a man who he loved, who was dead for four days, back to life. We get one glimpse of how Jesus walked through grief, but it's easy to lose track of the other losses in Jesus' life. You know, scholars speculate, and you kind of infer from reading the Scripture that sometime between when Jesus was 12 and when we see his, his launch of his public ministry, his father died, his earthly father. Joseph passed away because he's not in the picture when we start seeing the ministry. Gospels are silent, but you have to know that had an impact on him. Even though he knew God was his father, right? He is still his earthly father, the man who taught him a trade, raised him up, fed him, clothed him, all of those things. But... The Bible's silent on that. Jesus experienced the loss of John the Baptist. And not only was John the Baptist the one who prepared the way for the start of his ministry and the one who baptized Jesus, John the Baptist was family. Because you remember, Elizabeth and Mary were family. We think cousins, maybe? So there had to be some history there. Let's call them womb mates. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We initially cut that out when we were going through the sermon, <laughs> but I couldn't help. They were womb mates. <laughs> Crack me up. That was cringe. <laughs> Listen, John the Baptist leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when Mary and Elizabeth came together. Yeah. They knew each other before they came out of the womb, hence womb mates. Got it? Yeah. So, like, they were integrally, integrally tied together. Yeah. I threw him off. Wow. <laughs> All right. John the Baptist is later imprisoned. And in a twisted turn of events, he's beheaded by Herod Antipas, right? 
Um, his, he's partying. He's having a good time. Stepdaughter comes out, does a dance. And he's like, anything you want up to half of the kingdom is yours. And I don't understand why in the Bible anything up to the half of my kingdom is yours as a request. But you see that a couple times. That's, that's beside the point. Jesus receives the news shortly later, though, and he tries to go away to retreat. And if you're reading in Matthew, uh, we're not going to go there, but if you're reading in Matthew, you see that's where he go, gets in a boat and he goes across the lake and is met with a multitude of people wanting him to heal and minister to him. So Jesus, like any other red-blooded human, got angry with him, chastised him, and sent him away, right? This is a special place, like, when the Bible can come alive to you. Think about that. You just received the phone call. You just need a couple minutes alone with the Lord. That's, what, that's all that you need. Mm -hmm. So he gets ready to go away and to be alone with the Lord, but people keep following him. Mm -hmm. It's like, just leave me alone. But he doesn't do any of those things, right? He ministers to them. He heals them. And then he takes it a step further, and he even feeds them, right? It's one of the most popular and most um, well-known miracles in the Bible is the feeding of the 5,000, right? And that's just 5,000 men. It doesn't include them women and children. Once he's done all of it, then he sends them away, and he sends his disciples across the lake, and then he gets to go finally spend some time alone with the Father, right? But then he crosses the lake on walking on water, and that's where we see Peter walk out. So you see, it's interesting to me to see those events right after he gets the news of John the Baptist, because like we said, Jesus is fully man. He experienced emotions and grief just like we did even though he had the knowledge of, of being fully God, right? And so it's interesting to me because I kind of think about it, and this is just Brent's weird perception on things. There's nothing biblical here. There's no Bible scholar that says this. But it's like the action movie, right? You're, the hero gets knocked down, and then the music builds, and he steps up. He rises up, and, like, he just goes to level 10, Right? Like, he just lashed. It's almost like Jesus, like, okay, level up. Game on. Here we go. I'm going to feed 5,000. I'm going to walk across the water. You know, it, it, you kind of get that sense, right? If you look at it in the, in, the, in the context of losing John the Baptist. So, again, our big idea is sorrow will impact every facet of our lives, but God's comfort will redeem it and make it beneficial. So you might ask, how, what avenues will sorrow impact our life? Well, one of the avenues that affects our life pretty quickly um, is our emotions. So our first point is sorrow will impact our emotions and affect our health, but God's comfort can redeem our minds. So I'm going to just turn this to you, Brent. Like, How do you feel like, after your dad passed away, how do you feel like your emotions impacted your health? I wrote this out because I needed to. Immediately, I was too busy and focused on the other things to notice any sort of impact. You, you ever get that? You just kind of go numb and like, okay, I need to call the funeral home. I need to do this. I need to do that. I had the same experience I think most everybody does when he died and in the days following. Everything stopped for me. You know, I was off from work. And I spent a lot of time together with my my. Stephanie and the, and the kids and my mom and my brother at mom's house and uh, just kind of visiting and we like to play games and things like that. The first Christmas without dad was three days after he passed because dad passed on the 22nd. And I don't, Stephanie and I were talking through as we were, were preparing this and I'm like, I don't, when she asked, well, what was the first Christmas with like dad, without dad? Like I thought of December 2022. And that's when we took a trip together as a family. I'm like, well, this is a trip. I don't know how that's relevant to the sermon. She goes, no, Brent. The first Christmas without your dad was three days after he died. That is just a blur to me. It is just a blur. I vaguely remember sitting in mom's sunroom. I vaguely remember opening some presents. But I was numb, right? You're just numb. Um, I remember in that moment and in that time that we were together and God bless my mother-in-law for even being able to have us in our home and to open the gifts and to be together. That was one of the first things I remember her saying after John passed, how can I still have Christmas for the kids? How can I still carry on? 
basically is the question that she's asking. But I remember that moment of just feeling like at any moment he's going to enter the room. You know, right after they pass, the first time you go into their house, it's, it's any minute he's going to turn around the corner, any minute he's going to come up the stairs, any minute he's going to come in with a mm -hmm. ridiculous dad joke. Like it's, it's going to happen any mm -hmm. minute. Yeah, dad loved Christmas. Um, he was the one who actually wrapped our presents. So it wouldn't be uncommon for a present to be completely wrapped in duct tape. And a brick. Have a, a brick. brick inside of we it. We would get bricks, guys. He Wrap your main loved, and we have a rule in that family Christmas, you're not allowed to use knives or scissors. Hands only, y'all. Duct tape and a brick. Use your imaginations, because my dad did. <laughs> so after the funeral, the funeral was six days later. So it was a really long time of like, it felt like hanging, right? It felt like you're just in limbo. Because I know dad's laying in the funeral home over at Altman. We haven't had the service because we're given time for family to come in from out of town. And it was just limbo. It was just hanging. And so finally, you know, we had the funeral. We buried him. And I had to turn around and go out of town for a trip. I had to go to South Carolina for a pretty big conversion for work. And so in my mind, life's back in, you know, shift back in gear, life's normal. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to get used to the new normal. Let's move on. I, I need to be done. And um, that particular project, by the way, we actually failed. We had to roll back. And so I, as we were talking about it, I didn't realize. But that's another thing I, I was grieving in that moment with my dad is like the thing we'd worked on all year didn't, didn't work. And what I didn't allow happen, though, was the continual grieving process for dad. I assumed, okay, we're done. He's buried. He's in the ground. Funeral plot out in Gerald. We're, we're good to go. Let's move on. And so the business of my life and my ability to dis distract myself. Is anybody with me on that? I can distract myself. I'm a boss at distracting myself. Um, and I felt like I was just mostly over it. And so I'm just going to get used to the new normal. And it wasn't until like February or March after I noticed after he passed that I noticed things weren't right. I just, I don't remember what day it was. I just know there was one day I could not get out of bed. I didn't want to get out of bed. Um, I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to do anything. I just didn't want to do it. And I started not sleeping well and had no motivation for anything else. Everything just became bland. It just, meh, whatever. And it just required so much effort to push through, right? So um, as we're re researching it, it's like, how does the brain process grief? Um, I work in the medical field sometimes to understand how the body works, helps me to respond to it a little bit easier, help me um, how I can adjust uh, my life, um, my, what I'm doing um, in order to step outside of that grief. So listen to what Dr. Shulman said. It's a, it's a quote, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, she, is, um, she shared in a webinar on the American Brain Foundation, Healing Your Brain After Loss, How Rewires the Brain. So here we go. Traumatic loss is perceived as a threat to survival. Protective survival and defense mechanisms. This response engages the fight or flight mechanism, which increases blood pressure and heart rate and releases specific hormones. Grief and loss affect the brain and the body in many different ways. It changes memory, it changes behavior, sleep, body function, it affects the immune system as well as the heart, and it can lead to something called, I think you guys are going to be familiar with this term, brain fog. Yeah, brain fog. The brain's goal at this point with severe grief is just survival. Now, I want you to understand, low to moderate amounts of stress, this is good for the brain because it creates new neural pathways and it can help you to um, learn how to cope and how to adjust. But severe grief, severe uh, a traumatic situation, it, it stops what they call the neuroplasticity of the brain. Going out. She handed that to me like a person handed a scalpel to a physician. I just want to let you know. Um, so chronic stress causes a reduction in the nerve growth and memory and increases fear. And 
to help the person focus on survival. If you increase fear, then you're ready to go, right? Like, have you ever experienced that in, in grief where you're like, all right, you just start snapping at people because, like, you just, you're, you're, you're on edge. Like, you, it's coming at you. You're going to go right back at it. Um, the stress response has a negative effect, and the more it happens, the, the more it becomes hardwired. Okay, so translating medical, all of that points us just down to survival mode, right? Have you ever said that to somebody? I'm just in survival mode right now. Come on, like, yes. Oh, come on. In survival Everybody mode. Would, I'm just in survival mode. Sorrow, when it's unsurrendered, can cause us to shut down as a mode of survival. And I, I know this firsthand, right? Like, when I don't, when I was trying to deal with things on my own, I had it in my mind, I had it handled, it was good. I shut down. My body said, uh-uh, you're not done yet. Yeah. Um, we go on autopilot. We start to question everything, and the more we spiral, we start to think that no one understands, or if worse, they would think poorly of us if they knew how we were reacting or, or how we were dealing with things. Like, you should be over it already. Why are you still, what, what, what's, what's the deal? Um, the enemy's so good at that, isn't he? Yeah. Um, in an effort for the never-ending loops in our brains to stop, we'll turn to Netflix, we'll turn to Facebook, who's on the TikTok, you know, and all of that, because then we're escaping, we're, we're getting our mind off it, we're doing something else, and um, we just become emotional shut-ins. And if our brains seem to be wired for this, how do we, how do we overcome it? How do we get past it? Right. Um, and the answer is, is we have to look to the creator and not his creation. I can't look at myself. I can't look at somebody to help me get through. I got to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm hurting. Yeah. Um, Jesus modeled this. He retreated to be alone with God. Even Jesus couldn't carry the grief on his own. Right. If Jesus can't do it, how arrogant am I to think that I can? You know, when we um, get alone with God, we can be raw in a way that we can't necessarily be raw with one another or sometimes feel limited in being raw with one another. We can speak out those hidden feelings. We can cry out to him. Jesus cried out to God before his crucifixion, so much that he was, he was pouring blood out of his pores. Like, he was crying out. He was in distress. Um, we can be angry with God. We can sob. We can let our grief spill out all over the place, whereas sometimes when we're in the public eye, we don't feel like we can let our, our grief spill out. You know, I'm reassured. I'm reassured by Psalm 139, one, verses 1 through 6. Listen, guys. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit. You know when I stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything that I do. You know what I'm going to say even before it, I say it, Lord. You go before me. You follow me. Your place of hand... At, you place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. We don't have to hide anything from God. He's ready for the hard questions. He's ready to, to hear how angry you are. He's ready to help you process through that. Um, scripture promises us that we can retreat to the Father because he comforts us. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Guys, I reach out to this scripture every time that I start to suffer and start to feel a loss. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He doesn't just tap you on the back and say it's going to be okay. He doesn't just, you know, say throw a quick text. He Listen to this. He rescues he rescues those that are crushed in spirit. When I need to be rescued, I am a pile of mess on the floor. He will scoop me up, literally. You can feel the palpable presence of God, but you have to be able to surrender. We don't travel this road alone, guys. Be encouraged by that. This sorrow is such a hard topic. We don't travel the road alone. He doesn't intend for us to travel the road alone. The scripture is clear about that. As we worship him in music, he's there. As we walk with him in prayer, he's there. As we search him in the word, he is there. He's constantly able to renew our mind. We have to give him our thoughts, though. We have to give him our thoughts. So, Brent, through all of that, how did survival mode autopilot affect you? So, 
I'm going to be really vulnerable here. Can I be vulnerable right now? So it took about a year before I started seeing an improvement. Um, honestly, I, I saw a counselor. I took antidepressants. I still am. Um, under the advice, I talked to Stephanie. I talked to my doctor. And um, it helped. Like, it, it was like a crutch. It kind of helped me start to get through and start... But it wasn't until I really, until God kind of hit me upside the head with the two by four, and I realized I hadn't really sat with him, and I hadn't laid it at his feet. I hadn't allowed him to work in my heart and in my mind. It wasn't until that moment that I really started to see healing. And as a wife that watches, is watching her husband um, struggle with grief and give space and love and understanding, I could tell that moment when the flip the switch flipped. I could, I remember waking up and my husband wasn't in bed and it was the early morning hours. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where did he go? I wonder if this was another time that he couldn't sleep, that he had gone downstairs. And it wasn't. Do you know my husband was on the floor with his nose against the carpet, just crying out to God, just praying to God in that moment. And that was when the switch flipped. Mm -hmm. So sorrow will impact our our um, emotions, which will impact our health. God will renew our mind. Our second point for you guys today is sorrow can, will impact our attitudes and relationships, but God's comfort will redeem our attitudes and strengthen our relationships. You know, as the world keeps turning, sometimes people lose track of the journey. And if you're dealing with grief and you're dealing with loss, sometimes you feel a little left behind. I know that I'm not the only one that's experienced that before. And then we start to look at um, our situation compared to someone else's situation. Okay? Why am I going through this and they're not? Why is my life difficult and their life easy? And that starts to play and starts to um, really get into a point where it's affecting our attitude. So I can tell you that I've struggled with this in my personal loss. Um, my struggle, um, one of my struggles was during my son's senior year. You know, the senior year is exciting. You get to do lots of things with your kids, lots of cool things. There's pictures, there's graduations. It's, you're looking at colleges sometimes. You're thinking about the plans of what's coming up. And that year, sorrow affected our lives. Loss and damage and family ties kept us from experiencing the things that I dreamed of. Does that make sense? So uh, during those moments, there was people, there's lots of people that knew our situation, lots of people that were praying, lots of people that were um, interceding on, on our son's behalf. But in that, that moment, there would also be different people in our lives that we would have a normal conversation with, which was fantastic. And in that normal conversation, they would start to share with me what they were doing looking at the college they were going to, the things that they were doing. And I think that if you um, suffer from a chronic illness or if you've suffered from loss of relationships or if you've suffered with loss of dreams, that you can relate to me with this because that loss of dreams, it makes a normal conversation where they're, where they're expressing a, a win, a loss in your heart, right? And that's not what God, that's not what God intends. I can imagine... Um, what our lives would have been like differently. I can imagine the conversation that I would have been able to have with that person and, and the way that we could have celebrated together. I did truly celebrate with the person that, that was talking to me about their senior and talking to me about their dreams, but it was really hard. It was really hard. You know, there's someone in the Bible that did a really good job with this. And I'm going to, uh, she's, she gets a hard rap because she didn't always do the, make the best choices. Her name was Martha. But she struggled with loss and um, surrender much better than I did. You guys know Mary and Martha? Anybody remember their story? So they're famous for the squabble at Jesus' feet, which is better, to serve him or to, um, to sit with him. And in that moment, um, Jesus affirmed Mary, the sister. <laughs> I'm a Martha, guys. Like, I want to I serve. I'm, I want to serve. So Jesus teaches me that. But we're going to head to John chapter 11. Brent, you want to bring that up? Yeah. Jesus, no, you so there too. in John chapter 11, we're going to read 20 through 27. 
And it says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Now, this is in the context of, of Lazarus passing, okay? Lazarus, Jesus had spent a couple days. He had gotten news. He hung out. Then he finally came, and word got to Mary and Martha that he was coming. And so she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha had said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Amen? And if you'd only been here, if only this, if only that. But I know even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will in the re resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, that's a hard question. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is come into the world. Great okay. Sunday school answer, right? Yeah, I'm telling you what, this is, Martha's not tracking here. He, she is not getting what Jesus is putting down. He's, she's like, yeah, Jesus, at the end of times, we're going to rise again. It's going to be fantastic. And Jesus is like, I, I'm going to do something right now, but that's okay. I'm, what, what she isn't track with, she surrendered to. Can I just say that again? Like, she didn't realize that Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But in that moment, what does she do? She honors what has already happened. Up until that point, Jesus has, has healed, I don't want to say thousands because I can't speculate it, but it does say if we, did, if we recorded everything that Jesus did, it would, it would fill volumes, right? So at that point in time, Jesus had done miracle after miracle after miracle. He'd raised at least two people from the dead. She doesn't say, Jesus, why didn't you do for me what you did for them? Why didn't you tell the messenger that my brother would be healed like you did the, the um, Roman guard, I believe, the centurion. Why didn't, you, why didn't you heal them the way that you worked in, a, in this different situation? She, she didn't say that. What she did was recognize that he was sovereign. What he, she did was recognize that he's the Messiah. What she did was surrender to the plan that God had for them. And so I want to be like Martha. I want to be like, with whatever's happening in our lives in that moment, I want to be able to, to recognize, God, you are sovereign. You know things that I don't know. God, you are the Messiah. You've died on the cross so that I can spend eternity with heaven. Thank you for that, Jesus. I want to be able to trust that, that the scripture is real because I know that his promises have been fulfilled. So when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our grief, we can pivot from a position of jealousy to one of thanksgiving. God, thank you for the time that I had with my loved one. Thank you for the people that I met that brought us together in that loss. Thank you for the, the good memories. Thank you for the work that, he, that you've started in me that you're going, to put, you're going to see to fruition. Thank you for the work that you started in my loved one that you're going to see to fruition. Thank you for the opportunity to forgive and to be forgiven. Thank you for the people that you've put in my life that I get to spend time with right now. Because sometimes when we experience loss, we start to forget about the people that are in our immediate situation and circumstances and take them for granted when they are a blessing in our lives. Thank you, God, for the ability to learn how to empathize with other people that are hurting. And I think, I mean, that's an important point. Like, through our pain, we learn new skills, don't we? I learned how there, there's a certain, a certain level of empathy you develop when you lose a parent that you have when somebody else loses their parent. Like, you understand things differently because there are, there are so many ways that you grieve that you don't even realize. Like, if you've never lost a parent, you think you might know, but you don't. It, it, it's just, there's so much to it. Um, but let's move on. So we've talked about how sorrow affects our emotions, how it affects our attitudes and our relationships. And the third point we have is sorrow will impact our faith. It will impact our faith. But God's comfort will redeem it into a stronger walk. There are few things in life that can have us asking bigger questions than when someone dies. You ever notice that? We can go through life, and 
most people just go on autopilot. They're doing their thing. But when something tragic happens, a death happens, that's when we all start asking the bigger questions or we, we examine our faith, right? Like someone's died. Do you believe in God? Or any of those questions. And so for believers, it can be an opportunity for the enemy to cause us to retreat. It becomes easy to justify pulling away from others, staying home, and even not going to church anymore. Right? You, you, your world has stopped, and so you justify stopping everything. Right? We can question and even blame God in those situations, and ultimately we become stagnant or dead in our faith. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wastes no opportunity. My father was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, likely probably from a stomach or his pancreas, and medically was given 12 to 18 months to live. What I trusted from God and was that in all likelihood, those were going to be horrific months of chemo and pain. God showed my father and us his mercy and grace and a quick passing from dad because from the time that he initially even became to show signs of any sickness to when he passed, it was six weeks. That was it. And so God showed us his mercy and grace. I truly believe. Yeah. Um, he orchestrated the opportunity for my brother and I to say goodbye over the phone to my dad as he was crashing that night and hear him say that he loved us. Even in the days leading to that, God orchestrated that I would have a powerful conversation with Dad that reassured both of us that we had forgiven each other of challenges we've had in the past. I remember walking out of the, the hospital room that day thinking, you know what, if Dad passed right now, I'm good. There's nothing that's unsaid. And that actually was the last time I saw my father alive. Um, that was God. Yeah. That was God. I firmly believe that God prompted conversations. Like it, I, I remember thinking that Dad was being very intentional, and it was a little freaky because Dad initiated that conversation. I also heard that he had similar conversations with my brother, with his sister, with my mom. It, was, it sounds cliche, but it's like he knew, right? Um, and so I saw God's fingerprints all over those final days. And that bolstered my faith, knowing that, you know what, even though the outcome, even though he didn't heal my dad, he could have. It would have been a cool miracle story, right? He's stage four pancreatic cancer. That's like 90-some-odd percent death rate. Like, that's a death sentence. And they healed my dad. That would be a cool testimony. But that wasn't his plan. But he has the ultimate healing now. And it was all beautifully orchestrated. And so through that, I learned that God is there even when I don't feel him. And that, that's tough for me. Like, I'm a, if I don't feel it, is it real, right? And even when I don't want to pay attention, he's there patiently waiting on me. Yeah. When I'm distracted, when I'm not realizing I need to turn to him, he's, he's just right there. He's not going anywhere. My understanding and belief in God, orchestrating even the fine points of, his, of life was reinforced. That following Sunday after he passed, I was slated to lead worship here at church, and I did. I had nothing. There was nothing in the tank. And I think the worship team probably remembers that day. Like, I was just a zombie. But I knew I needed to do it. I felt like if I could just worship God in the middle of a horrible situation, one, it would be good for me, and hopefully it would be a ministry to you. Um, not because I want to build my problem and pat myself on the back. I'm going to turn my pain into something ministry. But like I was like, I just felt like I needed to do that. And in that moment, God filled me and God carried me through that. And that was such a beautiful thing. Um, Jesus, or the disciples had to learn a similar lesson when Jesus was crucified. Jesus even teed it up for them in John 16. Stephanie, will you read that? I have John 16, verse 16 here. In a little while, this is Jesus speaking, you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that, you will see me again. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does this mean when he says, in a little while, you won't see me, but then you will see me, and, I'm gonna, and I am going to the Father? 
And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus realized what they were asking, realized they wanted to ask him about it. So he said, are you asking yourself what I meant? I said, in a little while you won't see me, but a little while after that you will see me again. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering from the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she's brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. So the disciples are given several heads up right? This wasn't the only time that Jesus told them he was going away. But they still scattered and they still struggled when Jesus was crucified. But once he was raised from the dead and they had met with him and he had he'd spent some time with him, they were emboldened and prepared for the next step of their journey, which first was to wait for the Holy Spirit, which then radically transformed them, and then they met, followed in their master's footsteps, right? So grief, when used, can embolden our faith and lead us to a stronger walk, right? So we've kind of talked about how God will renew our mind. We've talked about how God will renew our strength in our relationships. We're talking about how God will renew our ability to carry out the calling on our life. So the question that lends itself to is... So what? This is our favorite question. Like, Pastor Amy goes into the so what. What do we do with all this stuff? This is heavy, right? Like, this is heavy. heavy. What stuff. do we do from this point? Because God has promised us joy and joy that no one can steal from us again. Mm. But it's hard when you talk about sorrow because we can feel that. So we, we have. Can't, we can't yet get that palpable joy that will never be able to be taken away, but it's coming. So we have a little bit more, and we want to give some practical advice. And I know it's 11 15. Can you guys hang with us for a little bit longer? We're going to have some practical things. We're going to spend Pizza's a little bit. Pizza's coming at 1.30, so yeah. just settle in. It'll be fine. I'm We're going gonna... Gonna... <laughs> to spend some time on the altar, okay? But first, we... so what? So we open the sermon with 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. But it's, Paul's statement goes into verse 4, and I want to read that again. It says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. And verse 4 says this, He comforts us in all of our troubles so, so that we can comfort others. When Again. they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God gave us. So God literally answers the so what in verse 4. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. Can I get an amen? We are called to comfort others. Use the pain that we have experienced and use it to be comfort for those who okay. are experiencing it. So let's look at a few practical things, right? We've, we've examined the scriptures, but there are some practical things, I think, that we learned in our experience that hopefully will help you and dealing with grief personally and helping others deal with grief. So the first one that we have. Hold on. If you're tracking on you version right now, I just want to let you know the title of this is <laughs> Poodles, Pillows, and Patience. Okay? So Poodles, Pillows, and Patience. Go okay. for it. So when you're dealing with grief personally, one of the first things you can do is dogs. Lots and lots of dogs. Lots of dogs. You and we have like, a picture what? of all of our dogs Come up on, here. let's go. These are all of our dogs. Okay, so why is, what, what in the world, stuff, Brent, what are you guys talking about? You, you, you told us to go to God. Yes, you're supposed to go to God, but God's given us some really cool things on this earth to help us with grief. And can I just tell you, caring for an animal, there's nothing like it. It helps you move beyond yourself. I'm not talking about cats, because cats are evil. I'm talking about dogs. <laughs> glory, glory. glory. I should have I let off with cats versus Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Woo! No, having um, dogs has helped us quite a bit. And in fact, when you look at a dog, a cute animal, okay, when you look at a cute animal, actually, uh, you release a neurotransmitter called oxytocin. And God is so cool because he created our bodies to be able to react in those situations in order to comfort things that are part of his creation. How mm -hmm. cool is that? So poodles, get lots of poodles. poodles. I'll be your poodle. We should get more poodles. I think we should. No, no. No, you're done. Move on. You, you, you the next one's see. highlighted your color. Go on, move on. Okay, remember, always retreat to the mountainside. Take that opportunity. Take time with God. It's a, t it's a time of busyness, but shut everything off. 
shut your phone off, shut step away from your email, go into your car where nobody, lock the doors. God knows that kids can find you in the bathroom. Like that's just a useless place to go. Go somewhere, get alone with God. That's how you can help deal with grief. Allow the sorrow to happen. Yeah. Do not be like Brent. Allow the sorrow to happen. Yeah. And secondly, be patient with yourself. It's okay. It's okay. You're okay. not going to get over it quickly. Things are going to be tough. It's going to come in waves. It is okay. I'm going to invite Rachel up for our next point. This is the pillow. Um, allow the memories of your loved one to be present. So many times people, uh, you might be afraid to talk to someone about your loved one that has passed away. Um, but we have this special reminder at our house. Why don't you show everybody? This is Papa John. Go ahead and show. This is the turn. Papa pillow. This is the Papa pillow. Okay, this Papa pillow was actually a Christmas present in 2020. I think 2020 or 2019. Yeah, 2020, 2019. He had purchased a, a um, some sort of photo blanket for for Jan, my mother-in-law, and this was the free gift for it. And he so he gave it to Rachel. <laughs> All right, my father-in-law was a prankster. He was really funny, or he thought he was really funny, okay? We can still discuss that. There was a time that after he passed away that this lovely pillow fell off of Rachel's bed and landed face up, looking as though his body was tucked under the bed and his head was hanging out, okay? So I just want to let you know, it's okay to laugh during grief because these, this thing, and I'm sure, like, I'm sure that the Lord was like, get that because I know what I'm going to do with that once you're not here anymore. And so have those moments where you're able to take pause and to really laugh and to enjoy the memory of the person that's passed away because there's lots of good and great memories. Mm -hmm. I see memories that, that you guys share about the loved ones that you've been able to walk with on this world that have gone before you. And it's just a wonderful opportunity to remind yourself of the blessings and of the laughter that he has. You can put pop up pillow away now. <laughs> yeah, take the creepy <laughs> pillow away now, please. <laughs> so the next one is allow others to care for you. How many, how, how many of you like to just go it alone? Like, just let me deal with it. I will be fine. Yeah, I, I'm there, right? guys. I'm I, 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 shut in, shut down, shut up. Like, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> just get over it. Suck it up. Suck it up. For me personally, not for you. Right? But really, allow others into your moment and allow them to take care for you take care of you. Um, you know, I jokingly put here on the, on, on the notes that, you know, Elijah, when he ran away from Jezebel and he was depressed, what did God do? Had him take a nap and give him snacks. Yeah, let's go. I want to take a nap and get don't, some snacks. Don't underestimate him with the pow power of a, of a nap and some snacks, okay? But on a serious note, and she doesn't know I'm going to tell this story, but that Sunday when I was leading worship for the first time after Dad died, I remember as I was walking around, because we'll have rehearsal, and then we'll usually pray together as a group, and there's about 30 minutes between that and the start of service. I'm kind of wandering around. I'm saying hi to people, and I noticed someone was standing very close by the whole time that usually wasn't nearby, and it was Christina. And I distinctly remember just being aware that like, she's staying nearby just to make sure I stay okay today. And I will never, ever forget that and how much that meant to me. Just knowing she didn't say anything, she didn't do anything, it was, she was just there. And that's, so allow others to take care of you, but also just take that point of like sometimes just being there is all you need to do. Just being in proximity. Being in proximity of the pain, don't run away from it, don't be scared. We'll, we'll have some tips for those, for you guys that are trying to support those in grief. Um, but uh, one thing that I think that is often looked down upon in the Christian world, and I just want to speak it against it right now, is that it's weak to have a counselor. It's weak to um, be on antidepressants. And I just want to call that out because I want you guys to, to hear my heart. The Lord heals us in miraculous ways, all right? If you had high blood pressure, you would take a pill to treat the high blood pressure. But you would also change the things in your life that were causing you to have the high blood pressure, Right? You should be exercising. You should be changing your diet. You should be adjusting the things. So many times in life, we've worked through the, the, the heart issues, and yet we still have the imbalance of the hormones that's in our brain. And it's time that we, ha we may need to go to a doctor, and we may need to say, hey, Christian counselor, hey, doc, 
Like, what do you recommend next? Because our God is powerful to heal through medicine. Our God is powerful to heal, heal through miracles. And so I don't want to denounce one way over another. I just want to stand and surrender and say, Lord, heal me. Let your will be done in this situation. And we have a few other tips. Keep moving. Count your blessings. But let's, let's talk about helping friends and loved ones. So we've talked about how we can cope ourselves, but really the point of our, our, our sermon today is, you know, we, we go through things so that we're, we come out the other side better, right? And so that we can be a comfort to others. And so there's some practical ways to help a loved one deal with grief. Yeah, as, as Christians, we should be able to get over the awkward. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that don't want to visit a person that's in the hospital because they don't know what they're going to say. There's a lot of people that are afraid to go to knock on the door when somebody's loved one's passed away because they don't know how the other person's going to deal with grief. Guys, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We actually prayed today during the, during the prayer time to fill me. The Holy Spirit, fill me more. Because you know what? It's not about us. We're an avenue of Christ at that point in time. And the Holy Spirit will move through us in those awkward situations. I'm the queen of awkward. Like, I just told you guys not to lick your hands and give each other a high five. Like, I'm the queen of awkward. I'm telling you what, the Holy Spirit will help you in those awkward moments to be able to respond how God has for you and to be the person that God wants right at that moment and right at that time. Yep. Next one is just sit. And Drew, bring that slide up. I put just sit, seriously, just sit. And, you know, we, we look at the story of, of Job, and we can trash his friends all, these ones, all we want, but they started off strong, right? They came, they sat with him in ashes for a week and didn't say a word. Sometimes, like the story of Christina, you just need to be there. I like to talk. Shh. I like just sit. <laughs> I like to talk. So sitting there is really hard. But I do need to be obedient to my husband at times, all the time. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Understand that everybody grieves differently. So just because you grieved one way, um, the fact that someone else may grieve differently, maybe they don't seem affected the same way that you were affected, doesn't mean they're not going through the grieving process. So just be respectful of that and to know that um, we can we all have permission to grieve differently. Resist the cliche. You everybody know what I'm talking about? You don't know what to say, so we have those kind of handy go-to phrases. Well, the Lord has a plan. It's all just in God's hands. And, and these are true statements, but like in the moment when you're on the other side receiving that, how many of you can honestly say you, you kind of want to roll your eyes? Right? Like, really? Okay, yes, I know he has a plan, but this stinks, yeah. right? Don't try to fix the situation. And you're not the Holy Spirit. Right. You're not the Holy Spirit. So not being the Holy Spirit, um, we do need to be listening for the Holy Spirit and following the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So there's a couple of other practical ways that you can be present and you can be attentive to the needs of people that are going through sorrow. This is going to sound a little weird, but I actually do this, okay? I put birth dates, anniversaries, and death dates in my calendar. Why? Because I, a year later, may forget that that person has passed away. Not forget about them, but forget that that's the day. And sometimes that's the date that my friend needs a phone call, that my friend needs a text. Those are dates that are hard to walk through because they wake up thinking about them and they go to sleep thinking about them. Can we just be a person that's attentive to some of those details and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us at that time? You know, our ultimate encouragement is found in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. And it says this, And now, dear brothers, we want you to know that we... That, we, that what will happen to the believers who have died. So you don't grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died to be raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers that died. 
I mean, we should be rejoicing sometimes when people pass away, knowing that God, we are blessed by a Savior who has died on the cross, rose again, and because of that, we will get to spend eternity with them in heaven. But the question that can sometimes be asked in situations like this is, what if I don't know that my loved one's in heaven? That's hard. We struggled with this question um, in the last year at a different time. I've been in the presence of lots of patients as they were passing. I work in the hospital, so I've literally seen, seen people linger between life and death. And there's sometimes uh, moments of consciousness where they're alive but not speaking, where they're breathing but they're not talking. And so I wonder in that moment, God, what are you doing? Even if they weren't a believer in, before that moment, are you, are you speaking to them right now? Are you, are you touching their heart in a special way? Are you giving them more time in order to come to know you and to be able to hear you? Because I, I want to be encouraged. Brent, why don't you take us to 2 Peter um, 3.8? It just reminds us. It says, with the, the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. Verse 9 goes on to read, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is delaying his return so that as many as possible will repent and come to a relationship with him. I came across um, a December 2022 article because this is a tough topic, okay? Um, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. Um, as we are talking about this. And it's an article from the Biblical Counseling Coalition, and it really does talk about these things. And it brings up Luke 23, verses 40 through 44, and it's the final moments of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, if you remember those moments in the Bible, Jesus is being crucified, and to the right is a thief, and to the left is a thief. One of the thief denounced Jesus and said, if you're really the king of the Jews, if you're really the son of God, then save yourself and for the love of Pete, save us too. Okay, that's basically what he says. The other thief says, dude, what are you talking about? Like, do you have no fear of God even now? Jesus turns to that thief and says, today you will join me in heaven. Can I encourage you that if you have a person that's passed away, that, had, that you're not sure where they are, think back to this story. Because I can almost guarantee you that there are loved ones of that thief that were surprised to see him in heaven when they got there. Today, that thief is going to be joining Jesus in heaven. How powerful is that, the day that Jesus rose from the dead? Or, I just, I think that's such a powerful mo um, story. Jesus also shared the parable of the vineyards. And in those moments, he said, he was trying to speak to the disciples. He was trying to speak to the people and say, whether if you come to follow me decades from now, or if you come to follow me right now, the reward is the same. We will all be in heaven together. So there will be, when we get to heaven, there are going to be people that knew Jesus for a moment, and there are going to be people that knew Jesus for the lifetime. And I'm just thankful that right now, that when, if you sit in a moment of grief, and you're questioning if your loved one is in, is in heaven, like that's I find that to be reassurance, that, we, that God would want that none should pe perish without knowing him. So let's stand up and let's close our eyes. In Isaiah 55, 6, we're encouraged to seek the Lord while we may while he may still be found. Seek the Lord while he still may be found. I think we would be remiss from, from today. For those of you that are questioning in your hearts, do I know Jesus? Do I have relationship with Jesus? If I were to die today, would I be like the thief that will be able to join Jesus in heaven. I want to give you that opportunity right now. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're in this room and you don't have relationship with Jesus, but man, you're ready to surrender. You're ready to call him your Lord of Lord. You're ready to understand that he died on the cross for your sins because of his death and resurrection, you have the opportunity to stand on the promises of God and be reunited 
once you leave this earth. All eternity in heaven. If that's you and you're in this place, I want to give you an opportunity to raise your hand and to receive the Lord Jesus. All eyes closed like that. Just a couple moments. join alongside and just pray this prayer together. Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Lord, there was nothing that I could do on my own. 